The next piece is interactions, which you can call facilitation. And under this, you have one species that is helping another and in turn might be benefiting itself or could simply be having no effect on itself. But again, it's helping another species. So this is slightly different from commensalism and that commensalism is one where you're benefiting and the other is not being impacted at all. And this is a case where one may not be impacted, but it is benefiting another. Good example of this is in uh, plant communities when you have the changes that occur over time. If you have a field that was, say, disturbed by some activity, um, volcanic activity, mudslide, whatever, and so it's just sort of this bare patch of ground. Plants start to migrate in there as seeds, and um, in uh, this particular area, you can have uh, this one species, Juncus, that can come in there and establish itself. In other areas, this might not happen, but those areas that have the Juncus tend to do better. They, the, species, the number of species is greater in these habitats because the presence of the Juncus facilitates the um, growing and uh, success of other, other species that arrive. It essentially changes the soil conditions, adds nutrients to the soil such that other species do better. They, it facilitates these other species. All right, diversity, trophic structure. Um, so when you think of diversity, you would probably think, okay, that's the number of species in a particular area, and that's indeed the case, or that's at least one way to think about species diversity. Uh, more specifically, we can think of the number of species in an area as what we call species richness. Okay. Whereas we can also think of species diversity in another way. We can think of it as a relative term, the relative abundance of particular species. So take a look here. We have two communities. They each have four species of trees. Um, so in, there, in that sense, the species richness is the same, but you can see the proportions are different. This one has an equal proportion of each of the four species, where this one is dominated by species A. 80% of the trees are that species. So you can probably imagine that while the richness is the same, this community, we, in one sense, we could say is more diverse. While this one is not quite as diverse because it's dominated by this one species, this can be taken into account by what's called the Shannon Diversity Index, which you don't need to know this formula. It's not on your AP sheet that you'll have for the test. But it's simply a way to measure diversity. You, you look at the proportion of each species, species A, B, C, etc. And using this formula, you can calculate a value for H, which again is the Shannon Diversity Index, and this value will fall anywhere between 0 and 1, with 1 being a habitat that has maximum diversity, relatively equal abundance of all the different species. Um, so it's a way to compare habitats and how relatively diverse they are. Um, and here's an example with, uh, I believe, soil bacteria and looking at the conditions, the abiotic conditions of the soil and how the pH can affect diversity. And when the soil gets too acidic, diversity decreases where between six and eight is sort of the ideal pH for this soil, for these microbes in the soil to reach maximum diversity. Um, it's thought that there's a relationship between diversity and the stability of a community. This has been studied at this place up in Minnesota, Cedar Creek Natural History area, where they've got this field with all these plots of land, and uh, this is a grassland basically. And what they do is they sort of uh, they have um, control groups that they just kind of let go, but then they have others where they reduce the diversity, and others where they enhance the diversity of these plots, and they see what happens in the system, how how stable they are. And what they find is that when these little mini communities have higher diversity, um, they have more productivity and they're more stable. That is, they can withstand um, being changed. They can withstand stress. If there's a drought, they tend to be more resilient and uh, tolerate those conditions. They, uh, they can be more resistant to invasive species, for example, as opposed to the less diverse habitats. Um, Communities can be, you can also characterize communities by what we call their trophic structure, that is the different 
levels in that community. The typical way to think of this is a, a food chain where you've got your um, producers on the bottom, your plants and algae and such, those things that are photosynthesizing, that are making food. And then you get up to the consumers. Um, oh, but well you can think of these guys, they are the autotrophs, and the rest of these guys are the heterotrophs. And amongst the heterotrophs, you have your herbivores, your first level or primary consumers. Then you'll get up into your carnivores or omnivores, your second level, third level, and finally fourth level consumers, the guys at the top of the food chain. But of course, you don't really just find chains out in nature, you find food webs because any one thing is probably eaten by all sorts of other things. And so in this somewhat simplified marine system, you've got your producers at the bottom, the plankton, some small animals that eat the plankton, and then larger plankton, and then finally fish, smaller fish, bigger fish, and the seals, and the ever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see the connections between the different species. So you'll notice that these food chains, um, so here we go, one, whoops, come back, one, two, three, four, five, there's five links in the chain, one, two, three, four, these links in food chain are limited, you really, you, you never see food chains that have ten links in them, or even really anything much beyond five or six, and why is that? Well, one of the main ideas has to do with energy. And that is, if you think about the second law of thermodynamics, whenever energy is transferred from one part of a system to another, that transfer never is 100% efficient. Some of the energy is lost as waste energy from the system. So for example, with your car, you have gasoline, which has a lot of energy in it. And the point of the gasoline is to get the car moving from point A to point B. Well, a lot of that energy is lost, though, as heat. In fact, the car is about somewhere between 30 to 40 percent efficient at turning the energy into gasoline into kinetic energy, the motion of the car. The rest is given off as heat. And so it's the same way in living things in that when, for example, a herbivore eats plants, only a relatively small proportion of the energy in those the plants that are eaten gets converted into new herbivore, new or herbivore biomass. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this example, you can see 10 or 100 kilograms of plant material is eaten, but it only ends up producing about 10 kilograms of new herbivore, herbivore biomass. And that's sort of the general figure, is you get about 10% of the energy transferred from one link of a food chain to the next. And so you can imagine, you've got X amount of energy down here at this level in the food chain, and each time you move up the link, only about 10% is transferred. So the total amount of energy left by the time you get to the top of the food chain is very limited because a lot of it's been lost as heat through metabolism and just waste materials given off by these animals. Um, it's also thought that food chains that are somewhat shorter tend to be a little more stable than longer ones. Um, longer ones might be dependent on too many links, too many species, and the loss of one of those species can cause uh, the system to uh, break down. All right, so there are some Let's just say all species are not created equal, you might say they're all important, but some have a bit more of an impact on natural communities than others. So you can have dominant species, and those uh, dominant species are just very prominent in the system. They make up a large number of the individuals in the community, a large portion of the biomass. And because of that, they can um, have an inordinate impact on the system. Um, So here's some ideas on how dominant species become dominant. It's just because of their competitive abilities, um, their ability to avoid predators. Um, there's also some cases where invasive species um, that are introduced can become dominant. Um, and this has happened with, with species introduced to North America where because 
they don't have any natural predators or things that are pathogens of them. They just kind of go crazy. Think kudzu, for example, in the southeast is this vine that just can kind of take over areas because there's really nothing that eats it hardly. Another thing, keystone species, um, these are ones that uh, may not be dominant in numbers or biomass, but they have a particularly important impact on the trophic structure of that system. For example, experiments have been done with sea stars out in the west coast in the intertidal regions, and where they've compared plots that are left as controls with sea stars and ones where they remove the sea stars. And what they you can see here is a really sh sharp decline in diversity in the experimental plots where they've removed sea stars, reaching sort of a new low equilibrium in terms of species diversity. Um, the sea stars essentially help promote diversity. They're predators in the system, and without them, some of the things they were preying upon can sort of take over and outcompete some of the other things and therefore have an overall decline in diversity. Um, this is also seen uh, with sea otters where there was sort of a um, unintentional experiment done in the earlier parts of the 20th, late 18, 1800s and early 20th century. Sea otters, these marine mammals, were hunted extensively and they're numbers declined quite a bit. That's that's changed recently with protections put in, in, in place. But when their numbers declined, what happened was these creatures, the sea urchins, went crazy. And that's because the sea otters like to eat sea urchins. Surprisingly enough, these spiny creatures, they figured out how to eat them and really like them. Well, the sea urchins feed on the kelp. And so when the sea urchins went up, the kelp numbers went way down. Well, what happened is not only did the numbers of sea otters decline, but the numbers of other species declined as well, because while the sea urchins eat the uh, kelp, there are many other things that also feed on kelp, and many other species that live amongst the kelp in these kelp forests. And they rely on that forest as places to hide and rear their young and things like that. And so as the kelp forest declined, the overall diversity of the system declined significantly. When protections were put in and sea otters numbers increased, urchins came down, kelp goes up, and the system tends to rebound and become more diverse. So therefore, sea otters are considered a keystone species. You remove them and the system kind of breaks down to a certain extent. Some species also manipulate their surroundings um, significantly. Humans are obviously a good example of this, but also beavers, when they build their dams, they take what was a, a stream essentially or a very small river and turn it into a, a section of it into a pond. Um, and so they engineer their surroundings. Okay, so within a food chain with um, looking at the trophic structure of the food chain, what can sort of control the numbers of individuals at a particular level? Um, well, there's thoughts that it can be things sort of what are called bottom-up controls, things from lower down in the food chain, and top-down, things from higher up in the food chain. So, for example, deer are kind of in the middle of the food chain. They are herbivores. They consume the plants. And then you got the wolves at the top of the food chain. And so what is it that's limiting or controlling the deer population? Is it predation or is it their food supply? Well, it's probably some of both. And it probably can depend on the year. So when you have a year where there's a drought, plant productivity is down a whole lot. Well, that's going to have a negative impact on the deer population because there's not a lot to eat. And they're going to have fewer fawns and fewer of those fawns are going to survive. And so in that case, it could be a year where it's really the plants that are limiting the... But there could be another year where there's lots of plants, lots of food, the deer population is starting to grow. And in that case, that means there's then lots of food for the wolves. And so now the wolves will start having a bigger impact on the deer population. So it's really not necessarily one or the other. It's probably a combination of the two and some years more of one than the other.